They send about 5% to get it. You can think you probably know where they are, right? Apple, Amazon, uh, Apple, right? You know what you get to And he said, they said, I mean, was 15% is given at lip service. In other words, they're talking about doing this, but they're not doing it. Experience user experience department, you probably know there are people in your company that think we're doing user experience, or they're saying we're doing user experience, but they really don't know what we're talking about, right? So customer experience is kind of like that, right? It's, 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 a, it's a new medium, people are getting into it, a lot of people are talking about it, they think they're doing it, but they're not. And then another 70%, the majority out there are clueless, they're not even thinking about it. So, you know, if you think we're in bad shape in the user experience department, right, which has a little bit more of a foothold, People in customer experience, it's the wild west, 5%. But the part that really interested me was the tax stuff, those leaders, that 5%. And what made them different from everyone else? There was a couple of things. Number one, they get in the DNA of the company. Those that were really good at customer experience, their leadership preached it, everyone in the company knew it. That was one thing. The second thing was, is they constantly monitored and improved the experience. That was very important. The other thing that interested me about these leaders was that they didn't measure themselves against their competition this way. They measured themselves against the competition this way. So let me give you an example. Uh, one of the companies that we talked to quite a bit was Intuit. How many people are familiar with Intuit? Love the company. I'll be talking about them a little bit more. So when they measured their customer experience, they measured the gap between them and their competition. And when that gap gets small, I mean, we're having this conversation with the future of innovation, when that gap gets small, they go ahead and do the tried and true, you know, determine, develop, and deliver, or research, design, and test. They figure out why is the gap that way, and then they get a design, and then they go back and have the next release date. They measure it. So, just, just a fascinating point. Any questions before I move off the slide? About yeah. So, how would they compare themselves? Were they doing the same thing? Yeah, so a company like, uh, if you're not familiar with Intuit, they are a software company. Uh, they make things like TurboTax, which is probably a good time to hear talk about that. Um, Quicken. We um, bought Mint, if you're familiar with Mint.com. Um, we've also moved into the mobile space. I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing in the mobile space with, with Snap. Yes, so they do very traditional usability testing against their product. There's also you know, other market indicators that you can use, like market share, which your market share against someone else. So there's very traditional things like that. Um, net promoter scores is another thing that's pretty much public. You can benchmark your net more story against your industry. Good question. Yes. Yeah. Let me give you a mic. Sure. Okay, my I speak loud. Yeah. Uh, this is a bad question here. What are some of the big companies that you think is a uh, little best about user experience? I heard big companies and user yeah. experience. What was the middle part? Yes. Which of them uh, that that uh, cool that? Clueless. Oh, who's clueless? Wow. Uh, I don't. I don't want to go down that road. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure everyone's experienced that. Though I would say most companies aren't good at delivering a user experience. I can tell you. I can tell you statistically, in terms of marketplaces, uh, the worst is the banking industry. So the banking industry right now, in terms of market segments, is delivering one of the worst experiences. Um, what that means is, if you're folks like us, that there's opportunity. Now, having said that, I, I will tell you that there are in that industry some folks that are doing some good things. Uh, Fidelity, right, has a really strong user experience department. They're doing some good stuff. Um, folks over at E-Trade, I don't know how many people use E-Trade, but it's a, it's a relatively, they have a good sized department in New York, and they're doing some good stuff too. So there are some, there are some lights in the industry. Yes? Where did you get that data about, um, for example, the banking industry is one of the what did you get the ranking? That's, that's, that's a very good question. So there are three areas that you can look at. J.D. Powers puts out this information. Uh, Forrester Research puts out this information. Gardner also puts out this information. That particular data that I just shared with you came from the Temkin groups. I mean, how many of you here are familiar with Bruce Temkin? Or, uh, yeah, okay, so me. Um, Bruce Temkin um, used to work at Forrester and started the whole research around customer experience and defined that as Forrester. And then a few years ago, went out and formed his own company called the Temkin Group. And uh, has a lot of really great data. So if you look up Bruce Temkin, you can uh, learn quite that. He puts out these great reports. Good question. Where do you get the data? You should always be asking that question. I always ask that question. Uh, where did you get that data? How big was the sample? Was it a significant size? Was that really our target audience? Right? Because you could have a great sample size, but if it's not your target, 
send it any good. Any more good questions? Oh, bad questions. Bad questions. Okay. All right. So now that's kind of the prelim. Now I'm actually going to go into ask, watch, and listen, and uh, what that's all about. Okay. How many people here know uh, the Betty Crocker story? It's it's a classic. Not too many more people. Ah, oh, this guy knows. Okay. So for those who don't know the Betty Crocker story, back in the 1950s, Betty Crocker made the first instant cake mix. And you would think this would be a pretty good idea because if you can take your bath where you get yourself back in the Wayback Machine, you go back in the 1950s where there was a lot of stay-at-home parents. They were making lots of cakes, lots of reasons to make cakes for birthdays and celebrations. And they made it from scratch. How many people have made a cake from scratch? Yes. Me too. Me too. It's a lot of work. And in many cases, the instant mix is just as good or better. Well, at least not good like I do that. No, because you're a very good baker, where I am not. So there you go. But anyways, you would think that this idea of instant cake mix would be a great thing. So um, if you know the story, Betty Crocker introduced the instant cake mix, and no one bought it. And they're like, what? This is a great idea. Why wouldn't people want you know, to be able to make cakes a lot easier than they, they did? So they did some research. We'll call it post-market research. They did some research, and they found out that the people didn't want to use the product because they felt they, felt they were cheating, and they felt it wasn't homemade. They had a, an emotional, visceral reaction that just adding water wasn't enough. What did they do to change the recipe? They added an egg. That's right. So they took out the powder egg, they put added the egg, and the rest is just right? Yay, very proper. They figured it out. The reason I talk about this is because in the 1950s, you could launch a product, it could fail, you could do your research and find out why, and you could fix it, and you could reintroduce it to the market. Do you think you can do that today? No. No, you can't. In fact, it wasn't that long ago in my industry of technology, about a decade ago, we do these things called launch and learn. I know, we don't know exactly what we need, but we'll launch this product out in the field, and then we'll see what they do after we launch the product. We'll figure out what sucks then, and then we'll fix it in our next video. And you know what? That, that's, still, that's still not a bad strategy if you are in a startup, environment kind of new wild west, but if you're in any kind of commodity, you're going to screw yourself because your competition isn't going to launch and learn and they're going to do their homework and they're going to get it right. So launch. If there's anything that you remember tonight, anything, this is the one thing I want you to remember. Do it early, do it often. This is like the most important thing. You do it early because if you if you spend more time and money in the later stages Right? Like the, if you get down the road and you haven't done your user research or your design and it's getting late, it's, it's, it doesn't get done, right? So you, um, you, don't, you can't course correct. You, you can't uh, make your best trade off. Um, in many cases, you don't do the rework. And what happens is whatever your product or service is gets released into your marketplace and it's crap and bad things happen, right? So doing it early is very important, and I will talk more about that. Doing it often. I like to say you want to minimize guesswork. I don't know about you guys, but I hate guesses. I hate it. I like to have the data. I like to show things to our customers often and say, is this right? Is this right? Is this right? How about this? Is that right? Because it's that iterative design process, the process, the, the contextual design process, in which you know by the time you're done designing it, it is the right thing before you spend a lot of money coding. It costs a lot of money to code something or to develop a product, whatever the product may be. Any questions about this? This is the most important thing. Do it really do it often. I will be mentioning this again. Delighting your customer is not a destination. This is something we've heard over and over again from the experience makers that we talked to. That delighting your customer is a journey. It's an ongoing journey. Market needs change, customers' goals change, technology change. Especially now, Moore's Law, right? Everything's changing at an almost exponential rate. So you have to constantly go out and monitor. And the other thing here is the Kano model. How many people are familiar with the Kano model? Okay, there we go. We got some marketing people here. The Kano model tells us that what delights us now is going to change. Let me give you an example. In the late 1990s, I bought a Kirasira device, big clunky thing. How many people remember this device? It was a, there we go. It was a per personal digital assistant, a PDA. 
Now you guys probably go, what the heck is that? Well, I'll tell you what you can do with it. It could act like a phone. You can make phone calls with it. Or, this was really cool, you could plug it into your computer and it would sync up with your calendar and email. That was the coolest thing in the world. It was kind of clunky. It was kind of slow. But in the 1990s, that was a cool thing. Nowadays, like iPhones and Androids, do you think that they would stand a chance? No, because what it took to delight me then has changed now because it's the market's changed. My goals have changed. Everything has changed. So the important thing about this, it's not a journey. Or it is a journey. It's not a destination. You have to continuously do this. Any questions about that? Good. How many, how many, here's an really interesting question. How many people here are at a company where you have someone in your company with the title customer experience? We got one. One. Is it a is it a VP of customer experience or a chief customer experience officer? VP. VP of customer experience. But it doesn't mean the same thing. It's different. So it's not this broad. No, it's more of the physical customer experience. The service part of it. Yeah, service. Right, right. But you, when when I when we talk about this, we talk about the product mm -hmm. and the service. But this is a very good point because the customer, like I said in the first one, right. Customers don't just experience your product, they experience a service if you have one. They experience your message, right? And they experience your people, the face-to-face the -face interaction that you can have. So it's a broad thing. And that person is in charge of all of that. And do they have like, a voice of the customer program? And do they have journey maps for the customer and fun tools like that? I hope so. You hope so? <laughs> They're very new, so I don't know. Oh, okay. It's a new acquisition, like you're saying. All right, well, get back to me on that because I want to hear all of them. Any questions about this? Being a journey and not a destination. Can I, can I just ask real question? Sure. A quick question about that. Is it is the customer experience person, the VP of customer experience, is their focus on the emotion of their customer ultimately? What is their brand affiliation with the customer? Like what's the like what if you boil it all down, what are they trying to assure that customer is getting? Well, it depends on who you're talking to. Right? If it was the finance department, they would say it's all about revenue and ways of increasing revenue. Right? Other folks would say, no, it's really about stickiness. Right? I, want to, I want to keep the same customers coming back more and more. Others who are more sophisticated would say, no, it's not just about stickiness, it's about wallet share. Yeah, 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 we have loyal customers, they come back all the time. What I want them to do is every time they come back, I want them to spend more. Right? Others would say, no, it's not about any of those things. It's not about satisfaction or loyalty. We got a ton of that. It's about advocacy. I want my customers to be so excited about what I do. I want them to sell my product for me. How many people do you know when they first got their iPhone or their Mini Cooper? These people are zealous, right? And they will tell you how much they love their Mini Cooper, or how much they love their iPhone, right? It all depends on who you ask, right? It could be about revenue, it could be about advocacy. Be all about all those things. But you, have, you talk about, hold on, you talk about the emotional connection. Right? We have a whole chapter in the book about the emotional connection and how people go about measuring that. And there are definitely folks, like for example, Coca Cola is a good example. They are about that emotional connection and what that means and how you measure it. That's another topic, though. I do that topic. <laughs> yes? Can you talk about, this is taking a step back, but, um, you know, I feel like a lot of us are still doing the lifestyle using the words user experience and um, they do a lot of work for ad supported websites where your customers might be your advertisers and your users might be the general public who's coming to your site. So to me the word customer is kind of misleading. I've even worked at companies where they have one department that's in charge of the experience for the advertisers and the sponsors versus another department that's in charge of the experience for the general user public. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. To me, this is fascinating to me. So in some cases, like with consumer products, the customer and the user can be the same person. If Let's refer to the customer as the buyer for someone, or the person who's going to be making a purchase decision. right? So someone who's buying their tax software, the customer in this case is probably also going to be the end user of that product. Right? Um, but there's other things that are not so much. So let's say, um, for example, we're talking about, uh, let's talk about a Disneyland experience since that's right down the street, right? The, the, the customer is more than likely going to be the end user of that product, but it also could be the parents or grandparents that, you know, love the Disney brand and what it stands for, and they might be the one buying the membership for the family to go. 
or in my world, I live in enterprise software. So in enterprise software, it's a much different thing where the customer, the person who's going to make that purchase decision, like the CTO or something like that, they're not going to be the end user of the product. The end user is some, some analyst that had nothing to do with that purchase decision. So what a customer is and what a user is and how that relates to the experience all depends on the marketplace that you're in and how big that divide can be. What if you're making a product that's not, that, that, that's not sold at all? What if you're making MS, the MSN homepage or something? Well, people are still experiencing it, right? Yeah, so at that point, customer. at that point, if there's if there's no again, let's use let's use the, the definition of a buyer and a user. So if MSN is only about um, increasing readerships, right? They're not interested in making any revenue off MSN, right? Then that's a, that's the end user experience with that website, right? It's a touch point for that product. Now I'm going to guess if you work there, you'd say uh, no, we are about making revenue. And by the way, we do have customers. Those are the ones that buy the ads. Hello, <coughs> right? So it, it can it can be different. And you know, so do you see how the user is the person who again the touch point with the actual product or service, and the customer can be someone who moves forward, makes the purchase decision, and is the one who usually has the loyalty to the brand. Hopefully, the I guess just my I, I totally see the difference. My question is, which one of those do you focus on when you're Writing this book, the customer experience revolution. We talk about both. My my background, my whole career, the last twenty years, has been in user experience. Uh, Jeff's background is in marketing and business development. So we talk about both. And what I'll be talking about tonight is going to be more about user experience because this is the user experience. Group. <coughs> but the book it is about more about the customer experience. And again, like I said, we have a chapter on emotional connection. We have a, a chapter on social media and platforms and things like that. But this particular chapter is really targeted towards. Uh, user experience professionals. Another, I think another thing we were kind of hinting at, which is also interesting, is where is customer experience in the org chart and where is user experience in the org chart? And I'm seeing different companies do it different ways. And like everything else, it's evolving, right? I see customer experience tending to be more in the marketing group, and I'm seeing user experience being more in a product or service group. And if it's a technology company, God forbid, they may even be buried in development, which is sad. So if you're in UX and you're buried in development, get the heck out of there and move up the food chain to the product or to the service or to make a bigger impact. Any other questions around customer experience, user experience? This is good. I like the question. Keep me awake. We'll fall asleep right now. That's it. Oh, Intuit. Right. So we're talking a little bit about Intuit. I love Intuit. Um, we talk to them uh, quite a bit. Um, that's talked to a lot of fun people that enjoy it. One of the things you may or may not know about Intuit is that Scott Cook, who's one of the founders of the company, coined the term follow your customer home. How many people actually knew that? Follow your customer home. If you're a user experience person and you believe in contextual design, Scott Cook realized this a long time ago. And it was one of the premise when he was, was starting Intuit to follow his customer home. He used to hang out at software stores. Now, if you, some of you are young, you have what software stores? What are those? Yes, there used to be places that just sold software. AHEC. How many people remember AHEC? Oh, you're dating yourself. Anyways, so he'd hang out. This is a true story. He'd hang out there and he'd see people buying his product and go, hey, I know it sounds kind of goofy, but you know, we're working on our install right now. You mind if I you know, call you home and watch you do that? And, you know, take some notes. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but um, that's how, how many people here do contextual import. How many people go out in the field and observe your user using your product? Woo! All right. Here, here. So he did that. He was one of the first pioneers. And still to this day, at Intuit, every employee of Intuit has to do what they call follow me. They don't follow me home anymore, per se, for lots of reasons. One of the main reasons is that a lot of their products now are mobile, right? I have my Snapchat and my iPhone at Starbucks, right? So they follow them wherever. And of course, they have laps. So you know, if you're in accounting, you're not going to go out in the field with the, with the UX specialist. You just walk down the lab and watch them experience the product there. But the, 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 the idea here is, that, is the importance of observing your users using your product and service and see what they're doing. How many, does anyone here work for Disneyland? Now that would have to be the coolest job in the world. Can you imagine you know, looking, watching people enjoying the rides or the attractions? Trying to figure out how to make those better. That'd be cool. Imagineers, right? OK. Let's move on. <coughs> All right, so I do, I, do have, I do have a case study here, a real-life case study where we 
put this all together and talk about it and tell you how it works. How many people here are familiar with skinning? Anyone have a skin device that's here? Okay. Not too many people. Right, here, right there. Very cool. So uh, Skinit is a, I'm from San Diego. They are a San Diego company. They started in 2006. There are two guys in Barrage. It's like every company. You know, people forget that big Apple and big Amazon and big HP, even Microsoft, really started with two guys in the garage. So did Skinit not that long ago, in 2006. And what they do is, is pretty, pretty obvious. They take a, an image. You send them your image. You tell them what your device is. And then they reproduce the image with an adhesive back to make it sticky so you can stick it on your device. Now, back when Skinit was doing this in 2006, they were like one of like 50 companies that were doing this, right? Everyone's trying to find the best way to do it. So the one part of the experience that they had was this thing called the photo uploader. And the photo uploader was a web-based application that allowed the consumer to upload their image, pick their device, put the image on it, and check out. Or they skin it also at a library of stuff that you may like, like you they might have in LA, right? So they would have an LA team that you'd like, um, like the Lakers, and you could pick that device and put it on your laptop or whatever your device was. The problem they were having with the uploader back in 2007 was the conversion was dropping out all over the place. So they, they didn't know why. They knew that their customers would go and use the uploader, and the number of, of users that came in at the beginning was um, significantly higher than those that actually completed the whole process. So they said, we got to fix this. We got to, what they really want to do, again, from a business standpoint, is we need to increase conversion. You increase conversion, of course, means increase revenue if you're a business person. But they knew that the way that they had to do it was they had to change the experience, because obviously people are having a bad experience, and that's why they were dropping out and not to do it. So that was, that was the premise of the case. So what's the first thing they did? Well, the first thing they had to do who's been paying attention, is determine what that experience needs to be. And how did they do that? They did that with profiles. How many folks here use personas? Here's a, here's a quiz. How many people saw a persona earlier tonight right up here on the screen? Yeah. 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 Nice one. That. Very good persona yeah. feel, I might add. Right? Skin, Skin was a smart company. Um, they had all kinds of data to create these profiles from. They had their own website analytics. I told them a lot about the pattern of where they were clicking and things like that. They also had third party information. There are companies out there that actually sell canned personas that you can work with and modify meet your needs. And they were really smart. They talked to their customers. Oh my god, imagine that. They talked to the customers. And they had a really strong set of personas. You don't have to do it that way. If you don't have the time or money to do it that way, you know, Donald Norman, Donald Norman. Yes. Donald Norman, thank you very much. Donald Norman will tell you that you can make ad hoc personas, right? If you're in a hurry, you're going to take your best lines, you're going to kind of guess what it is, but eventually please go out and research them and make sure they're traveling and make sure the right one. How do you do that? You talk to your customers. Not a bad thing to do. Any questions about personas, profiles, customer profiles? Sean? Yes. Before they did the talk to customers, Find out where they were. Oh, you mean in, in terms of the, the personas, in terms of the interaction with the device? Before they actually did the component, they wanted to find out where they were. Oh, in the process, where, where they were dropping out? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, there, right, so there's two things going on here, right? There is first defining who those people are and what their goals are, right? And then there's the actual interaction that they have. And it's going to be different based on personas, right? The soccer mom who wants to um, put a picture of her children on her iPhone is going to be a different persona than the college student who wants to get his uh, uh, favorite college team, or maybe sci-fi show, on his laptop, right? And they're going to approach the experience in different ways. And they're going to be interested in different things, right? Like the soccer mom, for example, is probably going to be interested in I want this picture, right? This exact picture, and I want it right there because it's my my child and I love them and I want them exactly like that. Where the college student might be, ah, I want my team, but I want to put it here and oh what other library images can I use? 
So it's almost like a searcher, a searcher for soda and a browser for soda, right? <laughs> One person knows exactly what they want, they want to go in to do that. The other one wants to play around a lot. Is, is that what you're referring to about how the different personas interact differently with the technology? I'm talking about when they first started, how did they determine where they were, where they were down? Oh, you mean how did they, they first being the initial, hey, who's using our product? Yes. Right. So there's a couple ways you can do that. They have a web-based product. So uh, they had, when someone has to purchase something, right, you can grab some information there. So based on their purchases, they can look at that data, and they can, they can start general profiles from there. There's also, you can also tell by what people were purchasing what kind of people they were, right? Were they more interested, again, in uploading their own pictures of their family, or were they more interested in working with the library of sports teams, for example, right? So there's several ways in which you can start with your initial assessment of what your persona is. The same thing would be true with service. You know, I don't want to leave service people out here. So let's say you work at a, a high-end hotel, and you want to start creating personas for your hotel. Well, there's lots of information you can start with, you know, based by how they, how they log in, how long they stay. Um, you can probably determine, you know, gender and age. Some people just come on their anniversary, for example, and those tend to be couples. That may be one set of personas, right? Um, there's other people who are travelers. That's a whole other set of personas. So um, by looking at the data that you have already, you can determine your initial or ad hoc persona and then develop from there. Good question. Any other questions around personas or developing personas? OK. Next, pay attention. Second D, they're going to develop the experience. Oh, they're going to do it early, and they're going to do it often. Again, one thing I want you to remember. Before you leave here, is how important it is to do it early, do it often. Because if you don't do it, there's dire consequences. If you're not doing it early, you're not doing it often, you're not doing user experience time. That's that. So in the case of Intuit and the, the uploader, which we later rebranded as customizer, um, the first thing they did, we took a very guerrilla approach to it. I'm going to explain to you the approach in the talk about more traditional way. But the way that we did it was we started with the original uploader. And we found a handful of people who actually worked at the company who had never experienced the uploader. And we had them try to do some tasks, right, contextual inquiry. And then we watched them, we took notes, and we asked them questions. And then based on where they were having problems or difficulties, we did a bunch of wireframes, paper prototypes, of what we thought a better design would be. And then what we did is we brought in friends and family, cheap, easy friends and family, who matched the profile. Right? We want to make sure, ask them a few questions. Yeah, you are a soccer mom. Yeah, you are a college student. Whatever the profile was. And we'd show them the paper prototypes. We'd say, well, what would you do here? No, you could do that. You don't call it that. How about this or that, right? And we iterate. We iterate until finally the group says, yeah, yeah, that seems about right. And then we took it to a higher fidelity prototype, uh, an HTML prototype, and we, we opened it up to a larger group, more like a data group. The sample size was much larger. And then we, we learned from that. So, the, where the wireframe told us more about the information architecture, the prototype told us more about if, if the visual design and interaction design work, the iconography, the color, the types of widgets that we chose. So the, there are three things that are happening here. First off is our sample size is getting bigger as we are iterating through the process. The other thing that's happening is the fidelity of what we're using, the prototype, is increasing in the process. And the number of iterations and the things that we're changing are decreasing. They should be decreasing, because each time you're learning something else. Any questions about the iterative process that we did here? Now, we did this like in, in 10 weeks with local people. There is a whole other extreme. I have a friend of mine who worked at IDEO, and one of her clients was um, Nokia. She spent a year traveling the world, watching children play games. So Nokia decides how they're going to do games on their phone. That's a, that's a complete extreme. You and, you and your company need to decide, based on whatever the release of that product or service is, how much time and money you want to spend on the process, and how big of a sample size that you need, and all those wonderful things. Any questions about developing? Yes? So at you, I was like, How do you feel about that? Uh, so I'll repeat the question. So the question was about IDEO 
And you're talking about their team is multi-discipline, right? right? Yes, so not just IDEO. Um, IBM's team, UX team, is also multiple discipline. Um, Apple's team is multi-discipline. So I think it's a great idea. And what, what he means by multi-discipline is that you have people with um, maybe an ethnography background that is really good at user research and field study. You have people that know a lot about technology, right? They know what technology can do and build things. They have people in marketing that know something about brand. So bringing these multiple disciplines together will um, help you do that. In fact, a good book on that subject, again, I'm going to go to Dallin Mormon, is The Invisible Computer. It's old and it's kind of boring. But in the invisible computer, uh, Donald Norman spells out, you know, where does user experience belong in your organization? What is the contextual design process? What are the goals that need to be on the team? So it's a wonderful book. Kind of moldy, though. But I still like it. Any other questions? How many people have read the invisible computer? No. How many people have read the design of everyday things? All right. Very good. All right. How about emotional design? All right, we love Donald Norman. We interviewed Donald Norman for the book. Funny story. So we're interviewing Donald Norman for the book, and uh, my buddy uh, Jeff, we have the book with, he didn't know Donald Norman was. I of course did. I'm a, you know, a worshiper of Donald Norman. So we're doing the interview, and I become so flustered, I became useless. And Jeff ended up. There you go. That was my time with Donald Norman. Mm. All right, delivering on that promise again. There's a theme here: delivering on the promise. So skin it do what they want to do. They want to increase um, conversion. And that's exactly what they did. So the results were, as you can see, the results were that they increased conversion by 350%, and they saw those results in just a few months. Now let me tell you a little bit of a backstory here, which I think is even more interesting. We did this project in less than 10 weeks. We did it under budget, we <laughs> delivered it early, and we saw this great return on this investment. Why? How? How did, why, why was that? So this is back when I was consulting. And one of the things that I do when I meet with a client, and I still do it today, my clients are internal, right? The departments that I work with. I'm sure you guys do have internal clients or external clients. But I'm sure you do the same thing I do. You do a needs assessment, right? How much time do we have? How much budget do we have? You know, how is it bigger than the red box? <coughs> and I sit down with my clients and say, okay, so here's all the things that we do in the user-centered design process. User-centered research, Design, give you this type of you know, evaluation. What do you want to do? And the guy I was dealing with, the CTO, said, We're going to do all of it. Yeah. No, Daryl, no one does all of it. Based on this release and what you need to do in your budget, what do you want to do? He goes, We're going to do all of it. He goes, No, no one does all of it. We did all of it. It's just, I think it's probably the only time I've ever did like, every step there was. My battery's in. Testing one, two, three. Yeah. Oh, is this much better? Yes. Oh, okay. So the battery's dead on that. I hate these switches. Um, now I completely lost track. So we did every step of the process, and I think it's because we did every step in the process that we really benefited from it. And again, it goes back to the steps that we did early in the process and the return on investment that you get. Probably most of you guys are familiar. There's so much data out there on just Google ROI of usability. And I think the, the data's old, but and I'm sure it's a lot more now, but it used to be every dollar that you spent in development before release was a $10, $10 return on your investment, one to 10. But everything you turned out in the design phase before you develop it was a one to 100 return on investment. So again, do it early, do it often. It just makes good business sense. And that's the way you should sell it, by the way, in your company. Because the people who are gonna be making these decisions they're business people. You know, they, they may say that they care that their customers have good experience, but they're, what they really care about things is conversion rate and increasing revenue, right? That's the reality. Okay, so this came from the CEO after we were done. Increasing the conversion of the customizer not only increased revenue, it also enabled us to provide a more compelling customer experience, which has driven significant interest in new and existing partner programs. Now, what Skinner didn't know in 2007 was that interest in partner programs, because of the great customer experience they created, created things like relationships with now Disney, Dell, HP. Whenever you go to any of these sites and you have them customized, whatever your device is, 
it's white label and skin it. So now they're making a lot of money because they got their customer experience right. Any questions? Yes? Um, you mentioned managers and product managers and CEOs may have a preconceived notion of what their user profiles are and you can't necessarily hear the information very well. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how to present intelligence to people who don't want to hear it. Man, you're just speaking from my heart. <laughs> so the question was, as the user experience professional, you sometimes run into product owners. They could be the product manager or the product marketer or maybe even the CEO. They have preconceived ideas of who their customers are. They know who their customers are and they really don't need you, thank you very much, telling them who their customers are. So the question is, is how do you educate these folks that think they already know what they are? What's that? Gingerly. Yes, a little, a little bit of savvy would do you well, which is why I don't do that, because I have no experience in that area. Uh, I think it's data. I really do. Again, it goes back to this idea that these are business people, and you need to, you need to speak to them in a business language. So let's draw from our user experience toolkit, right? Um, all of us have a little bit of ethnographer in us, right? You should use that toolkit when you're trying to sell UX inside your department. So if you're dealing with your CEO, put on your ethnographer hat, create a profile of who your CEO is, what is your CEO's goals, what does he care about, and then speak to him in his language. Right? I, I once, um, I'm sure a lot of you people have had this, I've reported in marketing, I've reported in development, I've reported in product management, I've reported in the CTO, I've reported into everyone. And at one company at one time, I reported into, what was his title? The VP of product architecture. He didn't know anything about user experience, he didn't really care about it. He was all about IEEE. He, it's all he talked about was IEEE. I didn't know a whole lot about IEEE then. So I went and I did some research on IEEE. Well, guess what? It turns out IEEE has some standards for human factors. So the next time I started talking to him, I only talked to him in terms of IEEE around these human factor standards. Well, you know, if we're an IEEE company, we need to start doing this user-centered design stuff because it says so right here. So get to know the language of the person that you're talking to and speak to them in their language. That's a great question. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Are you working on user personas kind of at the same time that you're doing stakeholder interviews, if you will, kind of separate but around the same time? Separate but equal. Um, you can. It depends. So I like working with organizations that have really... Oh, I'm sorry. The question was... My bad. The question was... Are you doing user personas, developing your user personas at the same time that people are developing stakeholder personas? Yeah, interviews are right to understand right. who the stakeholders are and what their goals or needs, what, right, the what their vision is. I'll tell you what I like. And it depends on the maturity of the company. But what I like is a company that has a really strong marketing department and they can communicate to me first what is what is the market problem we're solving. Tell me a little bit about the market, right? And then usually within that, they'll have what's called customer profiles. And what are those customer pain points we're leading and solving that problem? And then working from that data, which had already been done, right? Then you can break out those customers and determine who the users are in those customer groups and what is the goal that you need to help them meet. So I see it kind of as a funnel from marketing to customer to user. I don't think there's any really wrong way to do it. But the wrong way to do it is to not do it. And, and I'll run into people where you know they're talking about their design and they'll say, hey, does this make sense? And I go, I don't know, tell me a little bit about your persona. They go, what do you mean? Tell me a little bit about the goal that this person wants to achieve. And you know, they look at it like gears and headlines. But I can't tell you if this is a good design if you can't tell me what the goal of your end user is. Right? The important thing is to do it. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, then I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sean, um, for not only driving up from San Diego and having to drive back tonight. I think that's what, at least a three hour drive right there, right? Well, the way my wife drives, two hours. <laughs> well, you are, my wife drives two hours. 
Um, and I also want to thank the audience for coming out. And we had some amazing volunteers this time, too. So I'm, uh, actually, Carlos, could you come up? He organized the uh, volunteers who joined us today. And all of you who are volunteers, could you please stand up? Um, including our photographer from Filter, and Nate, and Terry, who did a lot Brian did like me, Brian Clayton, I saw your name up. And, oh yes, and Christian's here tonight, also one of our co-organizers who's been here since the beginning of the group back in 2007. He started it with Chris Chandler. So um, he's kind of at the advisor level now. Mary Levy, our Oh yes, we had um, Mary and uh, Lee. And Lee, you want some software from Moray that I need to give you uh, from the holiday party that I'll give you later. And our wonderful host. And our wonderful host, Dan. And also, Jason is doing two things at once right now. He's doing a Google Hangout, live streaming directly into YouTube. And he's doing a regular recording that will later be a higher fidelity that we'll be posting on our Vimeo account. We have both a YouTube account and a Vimeo account. So thank you, Jason, for multitasking in such an amazing way. And I do want to encourage everyone to take a closer look at D-Lab. Um, they're doing some really fascinating stuff, not only within you know, the, the company there, but also in the community. Um, so that says a lot about right. an organization. And so I would talk to their two people that they have here that are looking to hire, reach out to them, tweet about them. I mean, you saw the slides. They're doing amazing stuff. Who wouldn't want to work there? <laughs> you know, honestly, like, the person is right. Um, and Dan, thank you so much for being so generous by extending that really kind offer to join tonight for $99. That has never been done before. You guys are really lucky I would jump on that opportunity. If you've ever been here during the day, it's a completely different environment. And I've talked to people who uh, come from other co-working spaces, joined here, and they talk about the difference that in that experience. For example, uh, one person was down in another place in Santa Monica, and they said every time they took a client phone call, they felt incredibly uncomfortable because everyone around there to hear them, but because they have ambient music here and such a big space, you can easily have your important conversations without being distracted about you know, how you're disturbing your neighbors. And there are all kinds of experience like things that are very small but yet very important to being here. And I wish we had some uh, people who actually work here to come up and talk about uh, the changes that they've experienced, the benefits. Yeah. We, do, we do have a few members around. We've got one over there. We had a few sitting Maybe in the back. Maybe you guys could raise your hands. So we've got some people who are still working as well. So. If you guys could raise your hands, stand up, and then make something up. Maybe Don't people sure. come up to you and ask you, like, why are you here? And what, are, what did you experience? Because I'm sure they all have amazing stories. Um, so on that note, I think we're going to wrap up. We still have a tremendous amount of food. Thank you, D-Lab, for that. And um, there's still some beer. Yeah. And Sean, is, Sean is signing books up front. Oh, Sean is signing books up front. And then we're going to be heading over to Bodega after he's done with the book signing. So you guys can mingle, eat, and all that good stuff for now. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Woo! Woo! Thank you so much. Actually, we're still live, so let me cancel it out.